Um, our reading is from Galatians chapter 5 and uh, starting at verse 1. Sorry, I don't have the page number in your Bibles. Somebody got it. One one seven one. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by yoke of slavery. And then if you drop down to verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your wisdom to indulge the flesh. Rather, Serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those of you who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. start with. <clears throat> Father God, we just praise you for this word and um, we just thank you for Ian this morning. Thank you for the word you've placed upon his heart, Lord. May you anoint him for his, this work this morning. May you ready our hearts and our minds to receive this, Lord. So we pray, come Holy Spirit, be at work within us this morning. Amen. 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 I, uh, it's great to be here this morning. Um, I know some of you, I don't know others. I recognise some of you, but I can't remember your names. You know, that kind of, getting to that age, um, when, that, <laughs> when that kind of happens. Uh, I, as you know, I'm married to Jessica. We have three children. They are in their 20s. But, uh, you know, I thought that when they left home, that was the end of it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and then perhaps they start to look after me or Jessica. But uh, it doesn't work like that. And they keep coming home. You know, they go away and then they keep coming back. It's like a boomerang. Um, <laughs> we, also, we also have a, um, an old English sheepdog that we called Abel. We, we've had three old English sheepdogs. The first one was named Moses. Uh, the second, which was fun in the park, called him Moses. <laughs> and then uh, we had a, another one called Jedediah. We like biblical names for them. And uh, we thought Abel, what a great, because we wanted to call him Abe. So we were going to call him Abraham. But uh, I thought that might be a little bit over the top, particularly for some of our Muslim friends when I'm in the park shouting Abraham to a dog that doesn't really work. So, um, and, and the kids wanted a name of Abe, so we came up with Abel. Right? What a great name. He's a shepherd, isn't he, Abel? The trouble is, is that he's the most disabled dog you'll know. So, so we got Abel, the old Indian sheepdog, who's actually disabled. Because he's, he's virtually deaf. He was born virtually deaf. We didn't know that when we bought him. So when I was training him, I was trying to, I was calling him. He kept looking at the back wall. We've got a big, big um, 12 foot wall at the back of our garden. So he'd be facing me and I'd call him and then he'd turn around and he'd look at the wall. What is going on? And then I remembered one of my friends actually, who's uh, partially deaf, said to me, the most difficult thing is actually locating where sound is coming from. So I... I, we took him to the vet and we found out that he 
actually was deaf. But he's got all kinds of other issues as well. But he's the most loving dog you could meet. But, uh, but yeah, he's disabled. So I, I wouldn't be very prophetic at that point. See? Um, <laughs> in terms of what I do, I, I work two and a half days for the Bishop of Bedford at the moment. Um, that's an 18-month contract. Um, uh, helping and consulting with churches in the town centre. Um, and uh, just trying to help them. Actually, the in initial idea was to help them to work more closely together and actually how to engage with their community and use their buildings and, and engage with their community. So that's fun. Enjoy that uh, most of the time. <laughs> um, you know, PCCs are really important, I found out. And actually, having good wardens is really important as well. That's another thing I found out. I've come to appreciate the wonders of the Anglican Church. <laughs> And, uh, and I, so I'm being serious. I, I see it. it's just wonderful. I love all the liturgy stuff. You know, I think I spent the first 20 years of my life trying to get a liturgy out of the church, and I'm spending the rest of my life trying to get it back into the church in a good way. You know, so uh, so that's that's a little bit of what I do. I, we all, I also travel quite a lot and speak at conferences and different bits and pieces. Do a lot of mentoring and uh, coaching teams um, in Muslim countries mainly. Uh, so. Uh, Part of my my uh, sort of my, uh, my job is to help people to be relevant to the communities they're trying to reach. So, yeah. Okay, I love Galatians. Who loves Galatians? It's such a straightforward book, isn't it? You know. So Paul and his team had gone out and they preached the kingdom of God, and out of that preaching of the kingdom of God came a community in in, in this Galatian aspect. And it was a simple gospel. Christ has died for you and has set you free. And then he uses on the grapevine that there's this other group of preachers that have gone through. And what they've done is that they've started to add to that. They started to say, well, it's not just as simple as that. Actually, you have to do all these other things. And if you don't do these other things, then actually you will not be saved. So Paul is living. That's right. You know, can I just say something? It is not wrong to be angry. It is wrong to sin in your anger. <laughs> okay? But most Christians think that being angry is the sin. No, it's actually holding on to that anger and allowing it to become other things. Right? Also, I, I don't know, did you know it's in the... In, it just struck me as I was reading the, as uh, Wendy was reading the, the scripture this morning, it says, do, uh, do not have selfish ambition. It didn't say don't have ambition. I think sometimes in the church we think we shouldn't have ambition. <coughs> like, it's somehow, somehow humble not to have ambition to lead. I'm just saying this because you need new PCC members, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, some of us can think, actually, it is really, it, it, actually, I, I'm going to be humble. I'm not, not going to have the ambition to lead. Actually, Paul says, it is good to have the ambition to lead, but not a selfish ambition, not for your own good, but for the good of others, which we, we're going to hit on as we go. Anyway, so Paul hears about all of this, and, and I can imagine he's dictating this letter. Can you imagine it? That's what it's like. He says, I am astonished! You can imagine walking back and forth. I am astonished! Can you believe? I can't believe what I'm hearing. That the simplicity of the gospel that I preached to you has now become... You've got to add all these other things. You're listening to these people. You can imagine. And so by the time we get to the passage we're reading, he's calmed down a little bit. Um, he's a little bit more um, emphatic. <laughs> and he gets to this point. Chapter 5 is probably, verse 1, is probably the key verse in this whole book. It says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. <clears throat> Let me just say that again. It is for freedom... That Christ has set us free. And I can imagine at this point when, right, let's have a sit down now. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again with a yoke of slavery. Jesus didn't just free us. But he freed us for freedom. And you say, well, Ian, that's obvious. 
if Jesus has set us free, it's got to be for freedom, right? But actually, people can be set free and still be in captivity. Jesus didn't just free our will not to sin, which is the good thing, is right? Part of the, the gospel message is now we have a choice not to sin. That's great, isn't it? I mean, I think sometimes we are not so sure that's great. You know, <laughs> we would like it if actually, well, you know, that is my choice. But no, actually, as Christians, when, we, when we've accepted Christ and the cross has done its work in us, we now have a will that can say no. How fantastic is that? But it's not just that. It isn't just that he freed our will to be able to say no. He freed our conscience from feeling guilty. <laughs> Let that sink in for a minute. When we confess our sin, what does it say? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin when we do better. No? It doesn't say that, does it? <laughs> I, I hope you don't think it says that, because it really doesn't say that. It says, when, he, when we confess our sin, he is gracious and loving to forgive us our sin. Full stop. And then there's this wonderful verse in, in, in Psalm 32 where it says, not that, that God forgives the guilt of our sin. So I think often as Christians we live in this kind of penal kind of world. You know, this kind of justice kind of world. Well, God, so we have been released from, the, uh, from the, the effects of sin and from the penalty of sin. And that seems to be our, our emphasis. But actually, no, it's more than that. It, there's an emotional aspect to it. Not only has he freed us from the penalty of our sin, so that when we get to heaven... We will not, we will be able to get in, because that's kind of how we live our lives a lot of the time, right? It's, it's all about getting to heaven. Well, I know it's all about living here. It's not all about getting to heaven, it's all about bringing heaven. <laughs> so it's not about getting in, it's about living free. It's about that guilt, the guilt of our sin. The emotional aspect that holds us in captivity, being set free from that as well. <clears throat> he didn't just set our will free not to sin, but our conscience free not to feel guilty. <laughs> I'm just going to let that sink in, because I think a lot of us, and I'm going to have a drink at the same time. <coughs> A lot of us understand that the penalty of sin is, is gone. And somehow in the future, as we approach Jesus, that that was, that we'll be okay. That we won't end up in hell. <coughs> but actually it's more than that. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. That we can now live free from guilt. It went, um, this morning, when uh, the photograph went up <coughs> of you guys, I felt this little word drop into my head. And that's often what happens to me. I just have a little word that falls into my head. And I thought, well, okay, what, what do I need, where, where do I need to say this? And I felt I need to say this to you. I felt this is a new day for you as a church. Now, you know, that, that isn't rocket science, is it? You're looking for a new vicar. But I just felt God say, this is a new day for you, and it's more than just having a new vicar. It's a time to clean the slate. And it's a time to clean the slate, not just in terms of the things that have happened, but the guilt of the things that have happened. And I was sitting there and I asked my wife for a pen because I forgot to put one in my pocket. And, um, 
Because I just felt there was something else as well, and it was this. Do not let the past define you. And for you as a church, individually, there are things in your life individually that you allow in to define you for your future. But God has wiped that clean. So I want to say to you as individuals, firstly, don't let the past define you. Don't hold on to it. Don't feel guilty about it. It's time to let it go and really express, experience the freedom that Christ has set you free for. But as a church, there are things that you just need to let go. And not let your past define you. So when you find yourself going, yes, but do you remember when? These are bad things, by the way. You, know. <laughs> you can allow your inheritance to define you, but not your past. Do you know the difference, see the difference to that? Your inheritance is those things God has put in you as a group that bear lots of fruit. Your past are things that, that actually define you in a negative way. Do not let the past define you as a church. Okay, so what does freedom look like? Going to move on now. <laughs> we might come back to that. But <laughs> what does freedom look like? You know, we, we, I don't know about you. I, we hear a lot about freedom today, don't we? The freedom of speech. Yes? We all have the freedom of speech. The freedom of religion. That's, it's an oxymoron for you, isn't it? You know? I have found many religions that are free or bring freedom. I found faith that brings freedom. Religion doesn't normally, because normally man is a way of getting God. The freedom of movement. It's one of our favourite Brexit things, isn't it? And also the freedom to stop the freedom of movement. Now how does that work? <laughs> uh, the freedom to love as I want to love. The freedom to express who I am. I was listening to a song the other day, uh, the other night, uh, we, we run um, a, like a writing club on a Thursday night at St. Matthew's, and uh, we're sitting there, and uh, one of the guys I'm with, Jeff, he was playing this song, and it, it was just really interesting, suddenly this, this phrase, I had him to play it again so I could write it down, it's freedom without justice is freedom for the few who have bought the right to put others into slavery. Let me say that again. Freedom without justice is freedom for the few who have bought the right to put others into slavery. <laughs> I thought, wow. It just, it just struck me. I just thought, wow, that is so true. With so many of the freedoms that we, we hear people going, about, going on about, actually it puts a lot of people into slavery. I want to tell you, it wasn't a very um, uh, melodious song. Can you imagine trying to fit that into, into music? It was, it was more, it was, it was a weird, weird song, which is partly why I was listening. <laughs> and then later, I came home from that, and later I, I put the news on, and I was listening to President Trump exercise his right to free speech. But what he said was outrageous. He vilified people. He stoked fear that was unfounded and thought. And I thought, is this the freedom that Paul is talking about? Because by this time, I'm starting to think about Sunday, you know, so I'm starting looking at this, at this passage. And as I meditated on this passage, I felt that it gives us a, an insight into the freedom the Christ is talking about when he says he sets us free. So it's not to have free speech, to be able to say what you want. It isn't to be able to move where you want to. It isn't to be able to love the way you want to.
but <clears throat> it's a different kind of freedom that goes against that selfishness that is so often talked about when we talk about the freedom that I have as an individual. <clears throat> so firstly, and, and, then, and then the exercise, which I, wanna, I really want to come to, is that exercising of fruit. Do you know what I mean? That what is the fruit of freedom? When we have freedom, what is the fruit of the freedom that we have? So firstly, the, the kind of freedom that Christ sets us free to live. Firstly, it's a freedom that doesn't exploit people, but serves them. If you read through that, that, the whole of that, that, that passage, um, you'll find it talks a, a, a lot about that. You know, we often think of our flesh as those kind of sinful, you know, the, the, the list that they go through, sexual immorality and all that kind of stuff. But actually, the first thing it says in, in, in Galatians is that this, our flesh isn't a flesh. We're not to indulge in our flesh in a way that, um, uh, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase that. It's not just about those things. It's actually, here firstly, it's about a relational aspect of our flesh. There's a relational aspect to it. Don't indulge in your flesh, it says, right? And then it goes on to say, but rather love each other and serve each other. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Don't indulge your flesh. Normally when we think about indulging our flesh, we, we, we think about eating too much, you know, <laughs> having sex in places we shouldn't have it. You know, that's what we think about. But actually, the first thing that Paul picks up here in Galatians is, do not indulge your flesh relationally. In other words, don't gossip. Don't speak harsh words. Don't lie. Don't be impatient. Don't have dissensions. Don't talk about each other behind, behind, behind each other's back. But rather, love each other and serve each other. It's not just love each other, because that can be a little bit woolly sometimes, can't it? In our, in our present world. What does it really mean to love? Well, it, love is all about sacrifice, actually. The first thing about love is that we sacrifice for the other person. We lay down our life for the other person. So there's a relational aspect to uh, not indulging in our flesh. And then, and then, he, then he says, do not gratify it or feed the desires of your flesh. You know, that, that's that whole list there of, <laughs> of uh, things. So, so the first thing is, in terms of being free, is that we don't indulge in relational mishappen, relational sin. We don't indulge in those things. We don't allow ourselves to go to those places. The second thing is that we don't feed the desires of our flesh. If we feed the flesh, you will reap the flesh. So I just want to say to you, if you feed relational fleshliness, you will reap it. So if you are wondering why relationships are not great right now, you might want to have a look at how you're sowing into those areas. Thirdly, do not disregard the law, but fulfill it by being obedient to God. Because God hasn't set us free to uh, just do what we want. He set us free with a conscience. Right? So it's about fulfilling the law. It's not about disregarding it, it's about fulfilling it. And what is that law? It's the law of love. When we talk about fulfilling the law, it's the law of love. It's the law that we love God first above all other things. God comes first in our life. But it's not just that. Because that works out in other areas of our life, then then we love each other, right? And actually, what do the, what do the, what do the scriptures say? This: love each other as you love yourself. <laughs> if you do not love yourself, it is impossible to love other people, because you can only love them to the way you love yourself. And you say, Ian, 
Now you're encouraging us to selfishness. No, I'm not. I'm encouraging you to love yourself as God loves you. And he loves you. How does he love you? Unconditionally, right? You need to love yourself unconditionally. That's why we struggle with this whole issue of guilt. <laughs> That's why we feel guilty, because actually we cannot love ourselves enough to forgive ourselves unconditionally in the same way God forgives us. So as he exercised that freedom, we see fruit of the freedom. <clears throat> and we are fruitful because of the freedom. So if I said to you as a church, how fruitful you, uh, are you as a church? What measure would you use? <laughs> you see, when we talk about fruitfulness, you know, are they being fruitful? You know, you, you know I, I, do a I do a lot of consulting with churches, right? And, and nine, nine times out of ten, I ask this question. How are you being fruitful? And they always go to, well, we're not seeing many people saved, or we are seeing many people saved. We're seeing loads of people healed. You know, that's, how they, that's a measure of fruitfulness. And I normally pull them back and say, yeah, I'm not sure that's how God looks at fruitfulness, though. How loving are you? I don't want to know about your outreach programs. I want to know how you love one another. What does Jesus say? If they see the love that you have for one another, what will happen? They will come, right? You see, we, we get this all wrong. We want to go out and take the love and reach out with the love without actually loving. We want to do the Great Commission without understanding the great command. The great command is to love the, God, your, the Lord your God as your, as your God and to love one another, right? As he loves you. Amazing. It's really simple stuff, isn't it? It is. It's really simple. It's not... I, you know, when I read Corinthians, I think it's, it's simple. It's not easy. <laughs> but it is simple. So when we're looking at fruitfulness, we need to be looking at, well, what does God look for in fruit? Well, we find that at the end of this chapter. You knew I'd get there eventually. <laughs> How joyful are you? How joyful are you in good, bad, and awful circumstances? Is your joy so deep it never comes to the surface? <laughs> you know, because people will say to me, Ian, you know, it's not about happiness, it's about deep joy. And well, yeah, sure, I agree. <laughs> but that joy has to surface at some point. And when people talk about you, do they talk about you as a joyful person? I'm just going to leave it out there. You know, <laughs> how peaceable are you? And I use that word deliberately. How peaceable are you? Are you a peaceable person? Are you peaceable in yourself? Do you, do you have peace in yourself? Are you always anxious? Are you always on the edge of frustration? What about towards others? How peaceable. You know, when you go into a situation, do people tend to think... That was really good that Ian came into that situation because it helped to defuse the situation. Or do people come in and go, man, they don't have to incite a lot of it, a lot of violence here, yeah? <laughs> because you know, there's lots of ways way of doing violence, right? We think about thumping and punching and all that, but actually there's lots of ways of doing doing violence. We do violence every day. We murder people every day. Every day when we talk against someone, when we speak words that don't build but destroy, that's murder according to Jesus. We read the Gospels. How patient are you? 
I'm going to move on from this one because this is not my best one, you know. So. <laughs> How much kindness do you show? Let me ask you a question. How much kindness have you shown to people today, this morning, since you woke up? Have you done any acts of kindness to one another? What about goodness? Would people say that you have done them good? When people meet with you, they go away and they go, that was good. Even if you said difficult things, because you know, being good isn't just being all nice and sugary. You know, one of the things I, I, I love my American friends, but you know, I do I do get fed up of their sugary nature sometimes, you know. So you'll have an argument and then you're supposed to apologize for having the argument. Well, no, no, we, it's all right to have an argument. And actually we can do good to one another in our arguments, right? Because it's the way in which we do it. It's how we have that argument. It's whether we're looking to build up or tear down again. It's those kinds of issues. How gen how <laughs> do you believe people think you are faithful? Can you be trusted? How gentle are you? I was really torn actually to, whether to preach from this passage or from Philippians 4. Because in Philippians 4, you know, it's a very known, well-known well passage, you know, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, say rejoice. And then it's this verse that I, 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 I started memorising this, by the way, that's, that's why I know it. So, so I'm lying in bed memorising the verse, you know, and, then I, and I kept missing out the next verse. Do you know what the next verse is? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Sorry? Let your moderation be known to all men. Let your moderation, let your gentleness be known to all. Wow. And then it says, do not be anxious. But with prayer, right? Now, actually, how many of you are gentle when you're anxious? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then there's this, you know, when you're provoked, how do you respond? Because this is a great part, this is a great proverb that says, a gentle answer turns away wrath. Yeah, this is very practical stuff. I think sometimes we think it's not practical, but it is very practical. How, I, I challenge you this week, when you are provoked, to give a gentle answer and see what happens. It is wonderful to see the wind go out of people's sail. You give them a nice gentle answer, they go, I don't, oh, oh, I wasn't expecting that. It doesn't mean you have to agree with them. A gentle answer isn't agreeing with them, but it's how you do it. It's the spirit in which you're doing it. It's the fruit that you've allowed God to transform in your life. Are you self-controlled? Are you able to use your freedom of speech with responsibility? It's a good example of that. So that it builds and doesn't destroy. And then it, there's this wonderful word, verse... The, 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 last, the last bit of that, it says, because against these things there is no law. <laughs> because against these things there is no These fruits of the spirit that God wants to transform in your life, there is no law. When you are like this, it is really difficult for people to imprison you. They can put you in prison, but they can't imprison you. These fruits are powerful if we release them into the situations that we work into. So, you know, often when we think about the fruits of the Spirit, we're thinking about character development and how it affects me and I need to have these fruits. And that's all true. But actually, we need then to release them into the environment and the situations that we find ourselves in. And they are powerful. And do you know why they're powerful? I'm going to finish with this. Do you know why they're powerful? Led by God's Spirit. They're led by God's Spirit. They actually mirror God Himself. They are linked to His glory. This is how we bring glory to God in the earth. You know, I, you know, I, 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 I love power, power stuff. You know, I love people getting healed and. Uh, prophecies and you know people being raised from the dead and all of that stuff, right? I, I, it's great, isn't it? I love it. I, I, do you want to see it? Yes, I want to see it. Do you want to see more of it? Yes, I do. But it, that that doesn't bring the glory of God. 
The thing that brings the glory of God is transformed lives that are, are fruitful. That points to a sign and a wonder. It is a sign to wonder about, right? That's all we were used to say. Okay? The glory of God is released upon the earth by transformed people being fruitful. When I say being fruitful, I'm talking about these fruits. They change the situation. Can you imagine? Just imagine this now, right? Wednesday, Prime Minister's question time, our politicians, rather than going, <laughs> you know, I'm going, the honourable ge gentleman, and then being totally dishonourable to that person, rather than doing that, that they gave a gentle answer that suddenly they had gentleness in their midst. Can you imagine how powerful that would be? Or rather than trying to score political points off each other, they actually thought, what is best for the country? Not as what is best for having my ideology, but what is best for individuals in our nation. Wouldn't that be powerful? This week, when you're in your various situations, wouldn't it be powerful if you exercise the fruits of the Spirit? <coughs> if you release them into your family, where there's dissension, where there's conflict, and your families are conflicted, right? I've not met many families where there is no conflict at all. How do we do that? How do we do that? The fruit of the Spirit needs to live, us, live in us in that way. And, and don't misunderstand me now. I'm not saying that therefore we just let everything go. And you know, if, you know often we, we mix forgiveness and trust. So when we forgive someone, we don't have to trust them. No, we don't. You know, tr actually, trust one another is only the, the one one another that isn't there. Think of a scripture. Is there a scripture? Trust one another. <coughs> no, it's not. Why? Because actually we're not called to trust one another. We're called to trust God. Right? But we are called to trust, the, trust one another in the sense we know the God behind each other. So even if they fail and let us down, he won't. So it's not, not about not trusting anybody. Right? But sometimes it's right to have people to build trust with you. To earn it. So... Um, I was, this is many years ago, but I was counselling a, a couple that, uh, where he, the guy had committed adultery. He had broken trust. He had not just broken trust, he had broken covenant. Right? His wife forgives him. And I said to the wife, I said, okay, what is one thing that you want him to do to help build trust again? So she said, I want him to answer the phone whenever I ring. Right? So the guy goes, I can't believe you're asking me to do that. You know, he's a really well-known business, uh, businessman and he was in big, high-level meeting businesses, you know, so he's going, I, I can't do that. I, well, how can I do it? And I, I went, do you want your marriage or do you want business? That's the choice. He said, well, just not. I said, listen, if it was your business partner for phoning for you for something, would you answer it? And he said, no. I said, so you have never answered your business partner in a, in a meeting? And he went, well, no, I was not quite sure what I'm You know? And he said, but she's forgiven me. She should trust me. I said, no, oh, no, mate. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You now have to earn her trust. And she has every right to have you to earn her trust. So I'm not talking here about being mamby pamby and nothing, everything goes. And No, I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. You know, there are consequences that we have to live through when we sin. Our freedom doesn't take the consequences away. It takes the guilt away, but not necessarily the consequence. We have to want then to live, to, to be able to put those things right as well, right? It's important, it's an important issue. But the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. Long-suffering, joy, love, peace. Self-control. Let's pray.
Can we stand? Sorry, I'm not looking at my phone. I'm just getting a prayer up that I, that I wrote. <laughs> you can see how Anglican I'm becoming, right? <laughs> Let's pray. We seek the wisdom of the God who says, Blessed are the meek or gentle, for they will inherit the earth. We seek the wisdom of the God who encourages us to turn away wrath by giving a gentle answer. We seek the wisdom of the God who encourages us to let our gentleness and our joy and our love and our peace be seen by everyone. Lord, we seek your wisdom to know how to live fruitful gentle lives in a world that is often harsh and combative. We need wisdom to be people who diffuse rather incite emotions in a time of conflict and upheaval. We need wisdom in how to be gentle in our pursuit of justice and truth. Lord, hear our prayer.